Let me begin by welcoming you all to our second Zoolix in Austin. It is almost doubled in size, so we had to move to a bigger venue. And if it keeps doubling, we have to build something on our own, right? So we are, uh, you know, really happy to have all of you here. It's the same company, just not bigger. It's getting, as, as you can see. I'll give you a overview of the company because I think this a uh, lot of you are new here, and I will walk you through a little bit of our journey where how we got to where we got, because it's an unusual company, and it's going to stay that way as long as, I mean, as long as I'm around, so. <laughs> That's the only thing you can promise, right? To build something like this, to integrate all aspects, whether you have a sales and marketing, you are R&D and finance, you have a support group, and that, Building that takes a particular kind of organization. That's what I'm going to talk about here. I'm not going to talk a lot about the software because you're going to hear all about it, but I'm going to tell you the story of how you go about building this whole thing. And the entire Zoho product suite came from that type of a thinking where you know someone has to solve this problem, thinking whole, completely, entirely. And uh, this data and software, putting all this together takes a particular kind of company and it takes a particular kind of culture. And from that culture comes the strategy. You cannot have the strategy without the culture. This is well known, right? Strategy, culture eats strategy for breakfast and lunch and dinner. So you have to build an organization with a particular culture and from that a particular strategy and then you have to execute it. So that is the story I'm going to tell you. And yet when they work, all of them work together. When that whole organization culture that you built and the strategy, all of them align and the people align around this, the business runs much better. Not only the business runs better, it actually, someone like me, I mean running a, an organization now with 7,000 people with, uh, you know, spanning the globe, actually can also have a life without that constant stress treadmill that a lot of people get into in business. That's something that also equally important because I cannot be doing what I'm doing if this thing is not fun, if this thing is not something that I get to enjoy. Because you know, you can maybe run a sprint for a few weeks, few months, maybe even a few years, but people tend to burn out. That's actually also what is important. And that's true for me. It's of course true for everyone who works here. So you have to, you know, you have to achieve all of these, keeping that human element, the human being at the center of all this. Not a periphery, not a resource, but at the center. And so what does it take to build? These are the three ingredients that go into this. There has to be, of course, a vision, an animating vision. That's something that, I mean, it's almost, I say, when you have these visions of all days, it is, you are crazy almost by definition. You know, no one will believe you. No one actually, you know, it's, it's to rally people around this initially is hard. So you have to go about it with a kind of a drive that is sometimes feel insane. And I mean, my mother is always amused by me because from childhood she said, why are you so driven? <laughs> what is it? I mean, because my parents never understood that part of it. I've had these conversations with my parents often. Why don't you take it easy? <laughs> but in fact, now they think, well, you have arrived here. Why don't you just enjoy life? Just leave it all. I said, I'm enjoying life. This is life. This is the life I'm enjoying. But somehow it's, it's, you know, it's a different mindset. But you can see that it cannot be, in, sense, in a sense, genetic. Even my parents don't often understand what is it that driving their own kid. And so that means that there has to be, somehow you are possessed. <laughs> I now understand what it means to be possessed. And this was the vision that has been, the possessed vision that's been driving this company. And it is, you know, in hindsight you can see the bold, boldness of it. I mean, we are talking about unifying disparate aspects of software. And that, 
animates all our products now. That 45 plus products that now all constitute the Zoho suite. And we are rethinking the way we work. And these are all step by step by step we have arrived at this moment where we can now rethink the way we work. And the way that, for example, I said we put together this type of an event, that's an example of rethinking this, the number of people involved, how much coordination was required without that centralization. That is key. That it is not a highly centralized operation. There's a lot of distributed coordination. That is part of rethinking the way we work. And covering all aspects of work. Not only one aspect of it or the other, but covering the entirety of what we call work. And as I said, it is insanely ambitious. And when you look at, for example, this, this is just a one fold, and you see the sales and marketing, and you see our finance suite, and you see the collaboration of our office suite, mail and chat and office and documents and, uh, and collaborative drive, all of these in project management. And just this alone, you see the number of apps there, to put all this together, there is very few companies that will attempt this, this much. And yet, this is only a part of it. There's more. Yeah. And there is, of course, the IT and help desk. And there's, of course, the human resources that we have brought into this. And then on top of it, even we need custom, very custom software on top, like the Zoholix app, that's very custom to Zoho, they're very custom to this event. And we are creating tools that where you can identify these extremely custom needs and build those quickly and integrate with the rest of the Zoho suite. So all of these and the analytics to flow all this and the integration piece, all of these, it takes an extraordinary amount of that, that dedication to a pursuit of vision to get there. And that is what our eventually our culture enabled us to do. And today already it has an unmatched depth and breadth in the suite. And this is really the power of the thinking whole, thinking holistically about the problem. And it takes, along with it, as you mentioned about the drive, sheer drive required. And this is something that I've always had in this relentless determination that you have to get there. There's no other choice. This has to be done. That's why I often think there's no choice but to do this. And that has been driving this throughout. And these are tough problems. A lot of the software we have taken on, I mean, this very presentation tool as an example, it's now 12 plus years to get here, to do this level of quality that we have achieved. And it took that determination to stay the course. And the determination to make all of these work together. And to keep going. Because we actually, it is very easy in all this. There's many moments of doubt. Uh, can you give up on this product? Can you give up on this? Can we do it? Those questions keep coming. And we have to keep going, keep marching. That combined with patience and execution. So it required that boldness and patience. And that's something that today, particularly in today's world, really, really hard. And this is something I constantly coach our people to be patient. In fact, it's, believe it or not, one of the constant advice I give people is, can you sit still 15 minutes, no phone, no internet, nothing, no book, can you just sit still 15 minutes? Do this test. I spend actually long hours. There's, you know, I call the two modes of how I live as collaboration and contemplation. So there's a part where I'm, I'm dealing, I mean, I'm interacting with people, whether it's on chat or whether in person, all of it. And then there's a part where I'm actually completely alone, solitude. I actually have, in fact, I even turn off the phone or I sometimes don't carry the phone at all with me. I'm just completely silent. And, and I, when I go for a walk, I try to do that. I don't like to keep checking, right? So I like to get at least an hour or two of that, that contemplation. Because that 
Heart is what actually builds the patience in you. It turns out because you are not restless anymore. You don't have to go anywhere in a hurry. And that is what allows us to persist in you. That's the real, I mean, if you can sit still 15 minutes, train yourself just to not to disengage from everything, just sit still, actually you get a kind of patience that really pays off dividends. In, because you have to, in, in any really important work, you have to persist in India. And this is what allows us to take on 15-year R&D efforts. Actually, this office suite is an example. Our Zoho Mail is an example. I remember we started in about the fall of 2003. I actually remember about August, September, September, uh, late summer, fall. That's when we actually started that first piece of code on it. And it took us 10 years to get to a level where we feel it is something good. And now it's actually the fastest growing product. In our suite. I mean, we are a company that has reinvented ourselves maybe five times. We were known in 2007-8 as an online office suite. Then we were known primarily for our CRM. And now we are known as, of course, Zoho One. And we are also seeing a lot of traction in products like mail or chat, all of those. But a lot of that is because of that 15 plus year of constant you know, effort on it, that persistent. This also comes from this mindset that we actually don't, we are not going anywhere. There's no rush to the exit. And this word exit, as you know, is very popular in, in, in uh, most startups now. Startups are supposed to aim towards an exit. But we always, we just said no to that, that idea. That idea itself I disagree with. Because you do something because you love it. And when you do something because you love it, why exit it? What is the, you know, and you try to align your, your life mission with your work, then where is the rush to exit? You ought to be doing something anyway. Then I'm doing the something that I would always be doing, no matter what. So then why rush to the exit? So that is the, the philosophy here. And that's what has allowed us to persist for now 23 years. It's now over 20 you know, we are coming up on 25 soon. So there's a race whether I'm going to, all my hair is going to gray or we are going to get to 25 first. <laughs> so, but that's where we are heading. And we never raised money in all this. All of what you see, all the products, all of the announcements, everything is entirely homegrown. From the bootstrap, from the profits, we keep reinvesting, reinvesting. It also helps that from the beginning, actually from the earliest days, money never actually motivated me in this. That it was, it was never about how much do you have in your bank account, it is about what interesting things we can do with it. So if we are not doing something interesting with it, money itself is useless to me. I have nothing, no reason, no at all, no need at all with it. So that is, and to be able to do interesting things, you cannot really pledge the money. That is, you, you cannot have outside investors who have a different exit mindset. That's actually why we chose never to raise money. It also, this mindset allowed us to navigate two bubbles. In fact, it's actually true. We still support customers. We signed up in 1999. That's 20 years now. There's actually revenue clocked this month, when that customer, actually the original customer is from 1999, believe it or not. The products, all of them are, of course, now quite you know, removed from what we do in Zoho division, but still we have customers, we still support them, and they still pay us. That's amazing when you think about it. In fact, uh, you will not believe some famous names like IBM, um, Kiyosara, Minolta, all of them are actually customers from that time, 99. They've used some products from that age, and we still support them. And this is when, part of the reason they trusted it for that long, is that that particular industry segment, the telecom software, essentially vanished. The competition melted away in that bubble, and we were the 
sort of the last last one standing there in that. So the remaining business even came to us, and the customer said, well, "You guys are here, and so we keep doing business with you." So that's that's the attitude, and we also on our part we never raised prices on them. We were the last one standing in that business. We never raised prices because for us there is enough money. The attitude is there is enough money. Why should we raise prices? And this attitude is what we are going to survive the present bubble too. We believe there is a massive bubble right now, and you are seeing more and more evidence of it. You see the the kind of, of course, the housing house prices you see, but also the tech stock bubble, all of this. And if anything, history teaches you bubbles always burst, and that is true from the Japanese bubble of the 1989-90 to the Nasdaq telecom bubble in 99. Then we saw the housing bubble in. 2008-9, and the present bubble is going to come to the same end. So you need to, we need to build durable companies that can navigate these cycles, these huge cycles, where there was a time when business was too easy. I remember in 99-2000 we tripled in size, and then came the 2001-2 bust, where we shrank in revenue. A lot of our customers went out of business. So that. Type of stability is very important, and we we have built this company to survive these bubbles in a way, because uh, the entire our entire history is navigating these bubbles. And so this is what taught us to engineer patiently. So there is an engineering mindset, engineer patiently, because if we rush, we make shortcuts, we take shortcuts, we pay for it, and the customer pays for it, and support well. This is something that I will uh, talk about briefly, because there is something that. A lot of companies we take it very seriously. A lot of our folks are in support. A lot of our growth actually now is in support. And this word patience, I'll keep coming back to it because all the vision in the world is useless if you don't have the patient execution of it. The boldness of vision has to be matched by the patience in execution. And we have to be able to afford that patience. See, the part of the problem is even if you are patient. If you have, you know, in this business particularly, if you carry Wall Street on our backs, we cannot afford the patience. And this freedom from Wall Street is what has allowed us to afford this unique culture, where actually I don't have to worry about the quarterly numbers, I don't have to worry about making particular numbers now. And in fact, to tell you a story, one of our best opportunities this business comes. When a competition gets acquired by a private equity firm, because often I see that their support degrades, their product R and D languishes. In a couple of years, they end up, you know, being a shell of their former self, and customers migrate. We have done a lot of this, and we see that it's become so much a pattern. We watch for whenever private equity is acquiring companies, <laughs> and then we say, okay, there's an opportunity here. Because we know what they are going to do, and this is, you know, that entire mindset of exit, that entire mindset of extracting the most. That's what we are up against, and we have done very well competing against that mindset. And as I said, one thing that we are very proud of. Lots of times, this is actually a true story. In '99, we signed up a customer, and signed the license agreement. I was the one. I was. We had about uh, you know, 23 people in the company, and I'm the CEO, salesman, all of that at that time, right? I'm the only real salesman in the company at that time. And he signed the agreement, and he told me, called me and said, "I'll give you an advice. You are an idiot. <laughs> you could have asked me ten times the money; I would have paid you." He said this. You simply don't know how to ask for money. So take my advice: hire a real salesman. <laughs> you don't know how to sell. This is what he told me. And I actually thought about it. I mean, he had a point. He was right. But this actually, you know, the interesting part, that product in '99 that we left money on the table, 20 years later, is still making us money. That attitude of leaving money on the table, actually, those customers, some of those customers are still paying. They never switched out because it's so good a value. They never found a reason. They had no cost to complain. They just kept us and. In other words, in a sense, we 
maximum we we had a length of time that typical customers never stay that long actually and so in a sense you were short term right but this attitude we always had long term it turned out to be better but of course in 99 i didn't know there was going to be such a long term i didn't know that 20 years later there will be customers paying us but that attitude of thinking long term also we take care of employees i actually never want to lose an employee right for us the preferred you know hiring period is forever <laughs> that's what i say and because when we take care of employees they take care of customers that simple equation if you don't take care of employees they don't take care of customers so if a company has a customer problem that's because they have an employee problem and this attitude also extends because when you want an employee to be with you long term you cannot extract the most from them right now attitude it's not a resource to be exploited and exhausted it's not like oil it's not like coal you know employees are human beings and you have to nurture you have to keep only when people are happy long term that's when you have customers happy long term and this same thing extends to customers we don't want to extract the most from customers and as a result both employees and customers stay long term this also has resulted in another thing that we don't outsource support this is something that a question a lot of tech companies the first level support all of that they as they grow they outsource you have taken the stance that it'll all be in house and what this allows this attitude if there's a problem in support if there's a product that's experiencing a problem i know about it our product management knows about it our engineers know about it so we can immediately fix it is not some other set of people who are paid to take the pain we all have to take the pain that's something that has really helped us you know in terms of you know it's it's impossible never to screw up right i'm sure we have screwed up but the only thing we can do is learn about your screw up fast and fix it and this attitude helps us there and we have always thought of support as an important crucial career path that's something a uh, uh, essential value in this company to view support as a career path and actually what it has led us is there are support people who have moved into product management support people who have actually are because they develop that customer relation there is really good careers you can build from support and that's something that we see as an essential value here and this low employee attrition and low customer attrition go together and in fact our attrition rate is one of the lowest in the industry both employee wise and customer wise in fact if we look at our uh, landscape of customers we we exhaustively analyze the attrition because we want to learn from it why do customers leave us our attrition rate is now the lowest in the industry because we we look at all the various uh, statistics industry reports ours is the lowest in the industry and it's trending lower in the last two years we have had dramatic decline in the attrition and it's still going lower and this really helps us because this is the path, this is the key to being profitable in the software business because you you spend money in marketing to attract customers and if they leave you too soon you never made any money and it's a business is fundamentally at a poor economics and if you have poor economics you can never stay in business you can never support the customers so that attitude that keeping the customer long term keeping the employee long term so that we can keep the customer long term that that attitude pervades everything we do and this another aspect of it is this we create our own talent this you may have heard of the zoe university program and these are the young maybe 17 18 year olds in our program and we are now today we announced we are bringing this to austin so our future us employees also will come from this program now because we have actually as a company never believed in credentials that formal college credentials we are actually we believe that you learn the most by doing and most of the education for a skilled person comes on the job and this is true in software 
this is true in sales, this is true in marketing, this is true in any of these jobs. The formal education is often, particularly college today, you know, I can go on and on on this. I've become, I, I believe that colleges have become a, a predatory institution now. That you are extreme amount of debt, the kind of cost now involved, you know, $100,000 debt is you know, very normal now for a, for a young person to take on. And there is, I read a story of a dentist who carries a million dollars in debt, million dollars in college debt. And this person, he is on a program where in 30 years, he will pay 1.4 million and they will forgive maybe 2 million in debt after paying 1.4 million. So this is a story that I read yesterday. This is not a way to run an education system. This is not a way to train our young talent. And the only way to fix it is employers have to take action. No, we cannot go and fix the university, but we can take action. And because we are the one hiring here, we decided to take the matter into our own hands. The way this program works is we take high school grads, the equivalent of community college grads, and we train ourselves. We invest about a year, year and a half in very hands-on. You can see pretty intensive. They'll spend seven, eight hours in the classroom, and we pay them. And the reason we pay them is that now they are serious. They get serious. They know this is critical. They know they have to take it seriously. And they know that it's like a job now. I, am, I actually have to show up and I have to learn and I have to finish all this. Otherwise, I may get fired. And that is seriousness. At 17, 18, getting the discipline is extremely vital. And today, on the reverse side, young people pay a lot of money, a lot of money, borrowed money to college. To essentially, often, the college is a lifestyle choice now for a lot of them where you are, you know, you're not building the discipline, instead you are building a, a lifestyle, hedonism. I strongly disagree with it. I, I disagree with that system by itself in, in general. And the only way to express the disagreement in a free world is to create your own. So that's why we have created this uh, Zoho University. And 15% of our engineers are from Zoho University and they never went to college. They don't have a degree. And so all the software you see, there's a lot of it is coming from people who, did, who don't have that formal credential. And we are very proud of it. Someday I want to make this 50%. So we are expanding this program and we are going to create it here. We are actually, have a, in Japan, we have a started one initiative for this. So we want to spread this worldwide. And we actually hope that other employers will adopt this idea because it's actually once you do this, you realize you get a better quality employee and an employee without debt, and who also has a, a gratitude because the company invested in them. That's extremely important, so I hope you, if you are in this position, I would really urge you to experiment with these ideas. We'd be very happy to share our experiences. And it's debt-free education on us. And finally, all this is good. I mean, this company, you know, this event itself is a kind of proof where we have arrived now, but this is an outside validation. If you look at Alexa traffic ranks, Zoho is now globally 316th or something. And this is, last year it was about 500th ranks company. We can see the traffic exploding. I mean, we see it in our, we keep building data centers. And so this is, you know, kind of evidence. You can see the where it's coming from. Of course, India is top. And uh, the US, Japan, the, actually, the next country is actually Nigeria, that, believe it or not. So, those are the top four countries now in terms of our traffic. And it is growing. It is growing. And it's growing at a tremendous clip. And this actually does not capture EU because we have a totally separate data center. Today, the regulations now in Europe are such that we cannot commingle data. Now, we cannot bring their data here. So, we have a totally separate domain, Zoho.eu that doesn't show up in this ranking, but that alone will rank maybe within the top 2,000 now, somewhere in that. So, the Zoho.eu. And in spite of getting outspent on marketing, maybe 20 to 1. Like we actually, our marketing budgets are a, a fraction of what the competition will spend. In spite of that, this traffic is exploding this way. This means, I mean, the customers appreciate what we do. And I will have a request for all of you. Help us, tell your friends, and of course, tell us how to improve. Tell your friends about Zoho, because 
If we keep the marketing costs lower, we keep the prices lower. Because we don't want to charge you more to be only having to spend it in marketing. That's a core part of it, that we don't want to charge more. And so marketing is a crucial expense item. And if you tell your friends, we actually save money and we then you know, simply just keep the prices low. And this is part of that whole thinking hole, that holistic philosophy here. And finally, I'll come to the data centers I mentioned briefly. We are unusual. We actually don't run on the public cloud, other people's clouds. We build, we run our own servers. We own the servers on which your data resides on all of our eight data centers around the world. And these are the locations. So you see there is one in Dallas. Probably this particular presentation is now streamed from either Dallas or Quincy, Washington. That one is in the northwest where the electricity is cheap, the hydroelectricity. Then two in Europe, you see there. Two in India, two in China. We are adding two in Australia, New Zealand. As we speak, we are working on it. And the next five years, we'll probably have 50 data center locations around the world. That's where we are heading. So we are, we are now made it a really easy process to roll out new data centers after building the eighth one. Finally, we've learned how to do it better. So we are, we are rolling this out. Two more, as I said, in Australia, and there may be a New Zealand one as well. We might back up in New Zealand. And this allows us something that most cloud companies don't have. We understand the whole stack, the server and switch, the storage and firewall, the NOC, the network operations, and security operations. In fact, this is a big deal now where security, where we now have about 50 or more than 50 people in full time in security now. There's probably about 10 people working in Zoho who are constantly trying to break into Zoho so that they can detect vulnerabilities. That's important. That's an investment that we owe to our customers. So we actually have a full time staff that that's whose job is to try to break into Zoho. And so the security operations center is becoming as crucial a part of the cloud as keeping Zoho up and running. So that is the network operations and then security operations. All of these now we have a core competence. And of course, from the database all the way to the app on your phone and on your browser. And as I say, from the UI layer to the AI layer, all of these technologies are now built in-house with a strong, we actually have a, a next generation of UI framework. We just did R&D on, actually the, some of the key engineers are here and we'll, we'll meet them. And there is a good, strong AI team we have built. So a lot of the Zia uh, stuff that you have seen, a lot more is coming on Zia, knitting together all of the data, delivering insights from you, and automating more, reducing that, that manual work. That's all from the AI. And that part is all internal R&D, homegrown R&D. So this has allowed us to build that deep, deep, deep expertise in this. And that almost just avoid, see, the, the short term I mentioned, the rush to the exit, it also results in a shallower company. You don't build the depth. And it matters. The reason the depth matters is that you actually take the PC industry. If you are, you are old enough to remember a time when we hear the semiconductor, the operating system, the box, they're all different vendors. And there is system integration companies that put together these parts. And this is the way of the future. No one will ever build an entire complete computer by themselves. And the operating system and the compiler, all of this together. And guess we, we all know how that turned out when the iPhone happened, right? And the whole vertical integration is the way technology is heading back. And, and the reason is simple. When you actually integrate all this, you have considerable op opportunities to optimize the stack, make it run better, make it run more efficiently, and deliver better insights. So that's something that we, for example, we now are, we have rolled out a database technology that makes our databases run 20 times faster. It's done in-house. And this is a team that, a small team that thinks only databases. And this is a, a technology that is not yet commercially available, but something that we did in-house, we have rolled out. 
to the to our customers and something that we you, you won't even know but you will notice you know it just seems to run faster the same thing that we have a user interface kit that is coming up that will make the ui run faster and give you cooler effects so that's something that we did r and d maybe it's about taken 2 years for a team to build this but this flows into all our products now that the database work that's in crm that's in our analytics all of these products it will flow into all our other products same thing with the ui and so there is that and we can knit all this together and part of our you know our labs our r and d teams is to build these technologies that then we can actually roll out across our products so that's why this depth matters and long term companies with the depth of expertise do far better than the companies that are shallow in their thinking and this way i you know finish to say this you can see that it is actually our life's work it is literally our life's work the last 25 years of life now has been dedicated to this now it's and a lot of our people if you see the people here it's so 10 years is actually a, you know they're still young in the company <laughs> 10 years and you'll see people with you know 15 years 18 years a lot of them here so when you talk to the employees you'll realize that how long they have been with the company and this is what is powering your life's work that is what we are offering to you and that's how we think about it our life's work powering your life's work with that thank you very much